Hi, I'm Hannibal Taboo, and I'm in the garden. So Hannibal, um, you have done so much cool stuff. It is just Thank you. so much fun. Um, you've got comics, you've worked in journalism, um, mm-hmm. you've done other kinds of writing too. I have. Um, was there a moment when you woke up and you said, I want to write a comic? And and what was that like? Hmm. There was. Um, I was probably in third grade. I was about nine years old. I believe it was Mrs. Clark's class uh, in, in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, where I grew up. And I had this idea about a team of heroes that, because, you know, at, like most kids, I had a set of mismatched action figures from multiple franchises that didn't necessarily all go together in terms of height or anything else. But I wanted them to. I, 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 I had a story that I wanted. Them, and I started trying to figure out how to tell this story. I started writing it and I was like, no, no, this isn't going to do. So I started trying to figure out how to draw it. And I discovered several things about myself there. First of all, that this was absolutely a totally vital means of storytelling that I wanted to be involved with. Second of all, that hands are hard. (laughs) Yeah, they really are. They're really, really difficult to draw. And while I have, well, I used to have a real gift for, you know, drawing vehicles and jeeps and and buildings and perspective and all those i was fantastic with those things these weird little meat sausage fingers just didn't necessarily work the same way in my brain and i never really figured out how to depict them properly so i recognized my weaknesses there and instead of diving into them i recognized that i could just dive into my strengths because the storytelling was a natural muscle there was a when i think of something i can almost see it like click, click, click into place like Lego pieces. And uh, I often say making comics isn't a job, it's a calling. Uh, You don't make comics because you want to, you make comics because you have to. And I definitely believe that's been the case for me since ninth grade when Mrs. Clark was yelling at me to stop drawing in those doggone margins. That is absolutely awesome. Um, Now, comics is sort of a collaborative medium. Mm -hmm. Um, At least when you're doing comic book style books, there's always a team of people. If it's just the writer and the artist or the writer, the artist, the editor, and whoever, Mm -hmm. um, what makes a collaboration pop? I believe that for a collaboration to really pop, both people have to get acquainted with each other to understand their strengths and, and their weaknesses therein. And they also have to have a kind of a common goal. So for example, I work with Quinn McGowan, who is a few years younger than I am, and we both grew up in Memphis. So when I talk about, oh, that thing that happened at Liberty Land, he immediately knows what I'm talking about. I don't have to go through a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, I remember once I was working with an Australian artist, and I had to explain to him what a fade haircut was, how, you know, it like, it goes from, you know, not there to there. And, and he, really? he really had a hard time grasping the concept. Um, but, you know, I sent him several pictures and he ultimately got it. I don't have to do that sort of thing with Quinn. I don't have to do that with many other artists that I've worked with. So for it to really pop and for it to really, you know, I think come off the page and be evocative, there needs to be that kind of connection. That's not saying it can't, that can't happen otherwise, because I've read lots and lots and lots of amazing books where the artist and the writer barely even knew each other. Um, but in my experience, when that's happened, it's it's been somebody who I had an immediate shorthand with. So, for example, I did a book called Watson and Holmes where um, – I'm sorry. No, no, no. It was New Money. Watson and Holmes was a different guy. Uh, New Money with uh, N. Stephen Harris. And I have never had a more faithful depiction of my script. He just – every literal word in the script exactly as I wrote it wow. appears in the book. And he says – I know. Uh, he said to me – because at the time we hadn't met. But we had similar backgrounds, me from Memphis, him from New York. And he said, 
I read your script and I immediately knew what you were going for. I immediately saw exactly what you were trying to accomplish. And I didn't want to change that in any way. Now, sometimes artists will have better ideas than I do. But he's like, no, you got it right the first time. We're off to the races. Nice. Um, do you have a, a favorite type of story that you like to tell? Hmm. This may seem like a, a cheap answer, but it's true. I always say the next one. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> my passion is for science fiction and space opera. That's really where uh, my, my nerd soul wants to live uh, in a lot of ways. So, but yeah, I, I appreciate the mythic nature of superheroes in the same way that, you know, uh, we now see Superman and Captain America as people once saw Thor or Hercules or Gilgamesh. Sure. I appreciate the importance of that kind of storytelling and the impact that it can have. So you're, you're going through and you're writing a story. Mm-hmm. Um, you, do you start with the, uh, do you think a lot about the world building or uh, does it just sort of happen on its own? Normally what I do in my writing process, when I'm doing something from scratch, I start with character profiles. So um, I, 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 write, I have a little template that I've adapted from the official handbook of the Marvel Universe. It's much longer than theirs. Uh, and it has things like Chinese Zodiac, their date of birth, what you know they were like as a kid, what their voice is like, how do they walk, things like that. And I fill in all these things from the character. And as that happens, world building often occurs. So for example, if I'm doing a, uh, there's a space opera thing that I'm, I'm getting ready for a new artist that I'm, I met on Twitter. And I think about who this character is. And now I think about, well, if this is the case, and she would be from a planet like this. And then that planet like this would have to be this way. And then I scribble that in the side note off on the side. I use Scrivener, which is amazing and helps me capture every crazy mm-hmm. little thing in my head. Sorry, crazy is ableist. Every wild little thing in my head. Um, and in doing so, I'm able to start the world building with characters. So my first goal is to get to know the characters. The characters introduce me to the world. Then I start outlining. Outlining is the map. The script is the territory. And then I start scripting and then it hands off to somebody else. So where do the, um, where do the characters find their voices? Hmm. Most of the characters that I do are people I know. They're literally just, really? I just literally pick people. I'm like, you're this one, you're this one, you're this one. Uh, there's a character in this uh, project I'm doing, False Flag, right now, which is literally Dabney Coleman, the actor. Uh, I just think of the way that I think Dabney Coleman would act. I'm like, and this is what he would say. And I go back and I read it. I'm like, yep, that's exactly right. <laughs> How tightly do you plot your work when you write? Do you, um, do you write out every detail of it or do you just start and go? I'm definitely not a start and go. I'm, I'm a, a plotter, not a pantser, as they uh, say <laughs> these days. Um, it's, uh, I'm actually working on a project with another writer who is a pantser, and he says I drive him completely bonkers. Oh, but, I, bet, I bet you would. <laughs> but, but then like, I'll see him tweeting like, all right, I did this outline, and I fixed something before I even got started. <laughs> Darn that Hannibal taboo. And I'll be like, aha! So, <laughs> <laughs> nice. So that's always very entertaining to me. Um, I write uh, outlines first. That my, my first thing is a beat-by-beat outline. So I'll do act one, act two, act three. Uh, if it's a 22-page book, I'll divide that up into seven-ish or so pages for each one. I'll decide which one gets the extra page as I go along. And then I'll say, uh, page one, how many panels am I going to need to get this point across? Okay, I'll do that, blah, blah, blah. And I break it down, panel, 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 and then so on and so forth. And then once I've done the entire outline, I read through it to see if I want to, like, if at any point my brain wants to turn away and look away from the screen. If I want to turn away and look at the screen, the outline's not done. If I stay interested all the way through, then I'm like, now it's ready to script. And then I start scripting. And when I'm scripting, I often discover fascinating things about dialogue. I also, you know, I think about things that from the character profile, like, oh, I bet you they would react like this and this, you know. So if there's two characters interacting, a character in the background, I think, oh, maybe this character would interact this way. And I write that in as well. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a very... It's it's a very discovery based process that I work with. Interesting. What makes for good comic book storytelling, in your opinion? Um, good st- comic book storytelling uh, has to fulfill the promise that the book makes, and that's not a solicitations thing. That's when you open the actual text of the book. If you've never mm-hmm. seen anything outside of it, it has to fulfill what it leads you to. So, for example, 
perfect example is Seven Secrets by Tom Taylor. Seven gotcha. Secrets says there's seven secrets, they're in cases, and no one can ever know. And honestly, the more I don't know about the secrets, the better it is. Uh, to, to reveal the secrets almost would, would let it go because the whole idea is that they, they're not supposed to come out and the protagonists of the book are protecting them. One secret came out, I think, like, I don't know, like nine issues in. And I was like, oh, my. OK. OK. So this is why we. Oh, so do not do not let these secrets out. Got it. OK, <laughs> perfect. Wow. OK, sure. So, <laughs> That's awesome. And, and and doing so is is balancing the need for story with spectacle. And and you have to on top of that character has to stand to figure out how to uh, weigh itself. So even in a very personal book, even in a book where people are just essentially talking, like, say, for instance, Strangers in Paradise, there has to be drama, there has to be emotion, there has to be a, a, a spectacle of, of what this is happening, this is urgent, this is happening with us right now. And to see that happen in a book, perfectly balanced, is enormously difficult. It's very, very difficult to pull off. But when it pu- comes off, it's, it's diaphanous. It almost levitates. It's amazing. Nice. Is it harder to, um, your books have this sort of vibe and feeling to them. Um, and, and you actually do first issues really well. Oh, thank you. Does a first issue have a, a different formula than other books in the series as you go? I would say to a certain degree, yes. Uh, a first issue, because I try to follow mostly a traditional 3X structure. I've been trying to get in, Brian Edward Hill's been trying to get me into the 5X structure, but I'm not really sure how like the fourth one works so much. So I'm not so sure about that. But anyway, um, so the first one, you're walking in the door, you're introducing everybody. So imagine, say, for instance, you're at a party, right? You walk in the door, it's like, oh, there's the DJ over there, and we've got some drinks here, and hey, I know you, I saw you at that thing, and you know, and you're getting the there should be this kind of feeling walking in like, oh yeah, okay, this is this is gonna be okay. This is somewhere that I want to be. Um now that's something in the back of my head. That's not something I specifically for my uh, uh, a mechanical fashion uh workout, but I definitely with my outlining, I definitely think of, okay. This is the first part of the story. So I have to introduce everything to everybody and I have to make sure that nothing is left out that I need later. So because the worst thing, the worst thing for me is after I've outlined something like and I'm on like I'm deep in. I'm like almost to the end of the third act. I'm like, oh, but, you know, it'd be cool if I put this. Oh, man, that means I got to go back and change this whole doggone outline. Oh, well. And then I go do it. And then- <laughs> So, uh, because especially I learned that working with Stephen Grant on mysteries on, on Watson, the home, because I was like, I had never written a mystery before then. And he was like, here's, here's the mechanics of how this has to work and so on and so forth. So I picked that up and I'm like, okay, so the thing I need, I need to put that thing very early on. So when I reveal it later, I'm honoring the promise that I made to the reader. In the gotcha. Time. It also makes you look a whole lot smarter. <laughs> Luckily, they don't see me during the outlining process. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that way you can get all your foreshadowing in, you know. Exactly little, that. Little details here and there. And when they finally pay off, you're like, oh, wow, that was brilliant. There's so much There's so much stuff in Project Wildfire that I'm like, I'm like, well, could we just please put the issues out now? Could we just Netflix this right now just so we, I can get these gags out that I've built up and built up and built up and and – you know, I'm right now. Quinn and I are the only ones that know what these jokes mean, so it's, <laughs> it's just funny to me. How do you approach inclusion in your work? It's interesting you mention that because right now I'm working on. You know what? I guess I'll announce this. I'm working on a Dungeons and Dragons campaign book with a publisher that is also going to be adapted into a, a, a comic book series. Um, I'm not allowed to announce who yet, but that is definitely happening. Anyway, one of the first things I looked at was, okay, so if there's X number of regular races and X number of uh, uh, classes and whatever, how can I mix all that in while also reflecting things that are important to me? So, for example, um, one of the paladins of the main god is non-binary. Um Awesome. There's, you know, uh, uh, there, there's, I want to make sure that the world has room for everyone to see something of themselves. The head constable uh, of the, uh, the head constable of the main town, his husband uh, runs the bakery there. And, oh wait, no, 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 that's a different one. His husband runs the 
doc? I can, anyway, one of them. <laughs> he does something like super important in the southern part of the town. And I, that's why I always remember it's like his building is here. But um, I do this because I feel that discrimination against anyone is discrimination against everyone. And if everybody doesn't get a chance to play and be at the table, then it's not really going to be that great a table. They've done studies in business schools to say companies with more homogenous workforces don't do as well because they're not as creative. Everybody's got the same upbringing, same ideas, and they do the same basic thing. Whereas a more diverse and inclusive workplace will come up with more creative solutions for things because each one of them has different perspectives. Those perspectives have to be tested against each other and so on and so forth to produce better product. And, you know, as much as I love the art, as much as I love what we're doing, this is a business and I'm ultimately trying to develop the best possible business. So, you know, everybody deserves to see at that table. You've, you've written all kinds of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. What's your favorite medium to work in? <laughs> That's hard to say because it, and I had to explain this to my son because he's in a writing class in college right now, screenwriting class. And the difference for me between reading a, writing a haiku and writing a novel is only length. The actual mission is the same, that I have X number of words to get the idea from my brain to yours. And, you know, however many words it is or whatever, it doesn't really matter. I just need to make sure I hit the target. Uh, specifically. So there are procedural differences to me, but the only thing, like, for instance, I don't like Sestinas. Sestinas drive me crazy. They're kind of poem and they drive me really, sorry, they drive me really bonkers because I, um, the structure of them is very strict. And if you nail it, it's great, but it's really high level of difficulty. Mm. Whereas, you know, comic books, I can almost eyeball uh, a, a story and say, oh, that's about eight pages. Oh, yeah, that's about nine, you know, so I can almost eyeball it now to the point where I've done it so often, which older writers told me would happen. <laughs> uh, and and seeing it that way, may, I believe comics is is the best synthesis of, of all the things, if I can put it that way. Comics allow me to say, oh, okay, I'm going to, you know, throw this car at somebody and I don't have to worry about insurance or I don't have to worry about budgets or I don't have to worry about, oh, who's going to have to pay for the actual car and we need to get permits from the city or yada, yada, yada. I don't want to do any of that. Um, the freedom of expression and the possibility in comics is greater than it is with my prose novels because while I can write blowing up a, t a, a side of a mountain in Turkey, it's not the same as seeing it happen. Um, I remember there's an issue of this book called Star Wars Infinities where Yoda stole the Death Star and rammed it into Coruscant to murder the Emperor. And I was like, okay, yeah, I definitely wanted to see that. I would not have, I would not have gotten that in prose. I definitely wanted to see that. My favorite um, divisive question to ask writers is, um, mm -hmm. is writing comics like writing a movie without a budget? Can you just do anything or, or do you have limitations? No, it's not like writing a movie because uh, movies – are a different beast in certain ways. Uh, and uh, watching my son taking the screenwriting class, I'm definitely learning this. My wife went to film school as well. Nice. So um, writing a movie is putting together a specific kind of puzzle. If you've ever seen like those 3D puzzles where they're like, you know, they stand up on their own or whatever, mm -hmm. that's what writing a movie is like. Writing a comic, on the other hand, is like piecing together a story from snapshots. Uh, each panel is a snapshot, essentially. And that's not the same thing because, first of all, there's a lot fewer pieces, moving pieces in, in putting together a story full of snapshots. As you said, you have the writer, the artist, uh, uh, maybe a colorist, maybe an inker, uh, letterer, editor, and maybe a design person, if you're really fancy. Putting together a movie can be a much, much bigger thing. Uh, you can do it with smaller people, a smaller group of people, but you'll ultimately not lessen the work. You'll just have more people, fewer people doing more jobs. Um, so each one of those jobs is its own piece in that puzzle. Uh, the editing process is such a specific type of storytelling as well that uh, there's, there's a lot of twists and turns to it. So I believe, you know, uh, they're just different types of things. Uh, I don't know. 
I, I don't know that I have the patience for filmmaking. <laughs> um, I hear you. Because, I, I definitely don't. Yeah. Even writing, because the thing I'm writing with that Panzer is a, uh, intended as an audio drama that's going to be adapted for television if we get, get the budget. But even there, the technical considerations, the script has to be this way or people won't get it. The, the, it has to be formatted this way. If you don't have this part, it's not going to make sense. Oh, we don't use fade in no, anymore. That's really gauche. I'm like, all right, sure, whatever. Whereas, you know, the language of writing comic books, you know, Christopher Priest is writing comic books pretty much the same way he did in the 70s that he learned from Larry Hama, and, you know, and so on and so far back. The only difference is the stories themselves. The mechanics of filmmaking are so intense. Uh, and I get it. I totally get the passion for it. But I don't know. I don't know if I. I don't know if I can. So, who would you say your uh, your biggest influences are? Hmm. Well, uh, that would be many. Uh, I take most of my instruction from George Lucas. George Lucas, nice. uh, like me, is a USC alumni. I was in the English department. He was in the film school, and uh, he, you know, had slightly more. Uh, I don't know if I'd say impressive friends than I do because my friends are pretty great, but uh, Scorsese and Spielberg were pretty cool classmates to have there. Um, and he was dedicated to his vision. He was very serious about it. He was very uncompromising about it. But he really only dived into it after he couldn't get Flash Gordon, after he was denied a chance to play with the toy that he really wanted to play with. Then he made his own. So I appreciate what he's done with what's called string theory, uh, uh, the way that the first six films actually interweave into each other very specifically in very specific callback fashions. Mm -hmm. um, but I also learned a lot from Douglas Adams, uh, who taught me the value of, like I said, putting something on the third page that when you need it on the hundredth page, that it's like, oh my God, oh my God, it's that thing? Uh, <laughs> and to do it while it's being funny. That was enormously because the funny is a distraction. He 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 waves his hand at you while you you think, oh that's funny. How? Oh no, oh no, he did this thing to me, and that's fantastic to to be able to pull off. So Douglas Adams was the second one. Yeah, like the way the improbability drive works. You know. Yes. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the line not again. I was like, oh no. No, no, we're not doing this. We're totally doing this. Okay, let's run it. That, that okay. is one of the greatest all-time scenes in literature, that it's one. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. Um, there's also Octavia Butler, who was a master of craft, who, who um, worked very hard at, in the same way we're talking about inclusion, making sure that the voices represented people that may not always be heard. And that's... Uh, both important but also super interesting like my favorite book of her is pattern master pattern master is my favorite octavia butler book and it only works though if you recognize pattern master is the last stop on the train pattern master starts all the way back with a uh, wild seed in continuity uh, and then leads on and on and on through a whole set of books but when you get there it's so satisfying to me i really appreciate that so octavia butler as well and like I said, Christopher Priest and Dwayne McDuffie uh, personally took time with me to talk to me, to guide me, to offer me uh, their advice and their wisdom. And I, I really appreciated that. And I've definitely taken so much from both their work, both, you know, Christopher Priest's Black Panther, obviously, um, which you definitely see hints of in some things that I'm doing. But also uh, Dwayne McDuffie, I remember the line in the original Icon series where he's accepting a war, he says, I can fly, and so can you. And the way it carries across was so powerful to me. I was like, oh, my God, this is writing. This is how you do this. Okay, okay, I get it. Okay, I'm going to go. Okay. So, yeah, the, the, those are some of the writers that really strongly influenced me. Is it okay if I ask what working with Dwayne McDuffie was like? <laughs> First of all, um, he, he was, Dwayne McDuffie was very tall. That's the mo most noticeable thing that people know about. He was about 6'5", maybe 6'6", six, six, I don't remember. He was a very, very tall man. And as a very tall black man, that sometimes was read a certain way by people. Sometimes people would believe things about him that would not be true. However, he also had an advanced degree in sciences, which is very funny to me. Like he and Kevin Grievous, I think Kevin Grievous' degree is in biochemistry or something, like something ridiculously scientific. Except you look at them, you're like, and a lot of people wouldn't expect that. But there it is. 
their expectations may not be correct. So there are those dichotomies. And, and that <laughs> Dwayne was sinfully sarcastic. He was just really all of the time just this is not going to work. This is just, come on. Yo. He, he would send up anything, anytime for any reason. But he was also this endless font of ideas and creativity and belief in the idea that things could get better. And he was absolutely taken from us too soon. You know, it was funny. I remember when, um, when the Milestone comics came out, like for the uh-huh. first run, I was uh-huh. there for that. These books were just like, it was like nothing I'd ever read before. It uh-huh. was just so... Uh, so real and covering topics that you just didn't talk about in comics. After the image revolution, Mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, people took their, took their hat and went out and did something for themselves. A lot of people were looking at things differently. And Dwayne and Mike Davis and Dennis Cowan and Derek Dingle and Christopher Priest, who was there at the start to just decide not to play along. Sure. The logo, the milestone logo was actually designed by Christopher Priest. Fun story. I did not so, know that. Most people don't know that. Most people don't know he's the fifth Beatle of milestones. And that's just, you know, but it is what it is. Um, and they, they talked about hanging up their own shingle and telling stories their way with their voices, with characters that resonated with them. Um, Christopher Priest ultimately decided that this wasn't the sort of thing that he wanted to do with his career and didn't stick with it. Uh, not out of any sense of animosity, but out of the sense of it just wasn't the work that he wanted to do to build a company. And having been an entrepreneur, I can relate. It sucks. But <laughs> um, yeah, they they simply wanted to present. And they, like myself, wanted to have the books that they wished that they could have seen when they were coming up. They wanted to have the books that that if they went to the store and they spun the spinner rack back when we had spinner racks, they would see this and they would see themselves and they would feel something closer to their own experience. And, and I definitely, I definitely follow in that tradition very closely. It's so important. I think I understood it uh, in the abstract, you know what I mean? Uh Mm -hmm. Um, But then I came out and um, I, I, uh, I started reading trans fiction Mm-hmm. And uh, it just hit me really hard. I'm like, oh wow, yeah, I'm I'm seen. I get it. It's it's such a big deal. Um, yeah. What do you feel like um, when when you feel spoken to by representation? There's a line I use a lot of the time uh, from this rapper called Raskas. It says, "The diameter of your knowledge is the circumference of your activity." Nice. So if you can't if your brain doesn't hold the information to give you a possibility, your, your life can't execute it. It can't happen. So, and funny enough, Arthur Dent was a perfect example of that because he never did get it together. But <laughs> uh, he never got it together. Through all of those five books, he never actually understood what was happening almost ever. And I loved it about it. Um, but anyway, so, uh, so when... When I see myself seen, or when somebody sees themselves represented on things, um, I'm reminded this artist named Nicholas uh, Smith. He he did a mural of Chadwick Boseman, where Chadwick Boseman was with this kid who had a Black Panther mask on, and both of them are doing the Wakanda Forever salute. And uh, the idea that when you see yourself as a hero, when you see yourself, oh, I could be president, oh, I could be a hero, or I could do this thing then that opens your mind and literally your, the neurons firing in your brain are open to different pathways, different possibilities open up. You create a different mental reality for yourself. So we literally as writers and artists and creatives can alter the world with words. We literally can reconfigure it in the same way that the ancient spiritual traditions taught us that breath is prayer that the things we say will manifest. So, yeah, I I believe very strongly that it's important to have that so we can create these new possibilities because simply this is not going to do. This is not good. Like like the people of Cricket, oh, Mm -hmm. no, this will never do. All this has got to go. (laughs) All this has got to go. Wow, I'm I'm doing Douglas Adams thing so hard tonight. (laughs) No, it's it's totally great. Um, I'm really enjoying this. You are a fabulous guest. Thank you. Um, so 
Is there such a thing as bad or poor representation? And how do you avoid doing that as a writer? <laughs> when one of my friends and I is this guy named Vince Moore, and we sat down and came up with what we call the Black Hero Origin Algorithm for major labels. And uh, it stated that with very, very few exceptions, Black heroes either had been in the Olympics, came from criminal background, um, wore the mantle of another earlier white hero, or what was the fourth thing? There was a fourth thing. I can't remember. Lightning powers. Like, I th- lightning powers <laughs> is a corollary. I do remember that. But, um, and we actually, we, we ended up presenting it to Dwayne McDuffie. And he was like, first of all, I'm very angry at you. I'm very <laughs> angry at you for pointing this out. Uh, and second of all, I'm very glad to say the milestone doesn't do any of this. But this is frighteningly accurate. And I'm very angry <laughs> at you for pointing it out. So... <laughs> There's a character that because we, we we looked at this this criteria. There's a character named Triathlon that was an Avenger, and Triathlon is possibly the worst possible representation, which is no slight against his creators, who are all super talented people. But he uh, has uh, a weakness of character. He's manipulated by other people. He wears the mantle of another uh, person. He, I mean, he's he's everything wrong, and all of those things while wearing a red, black, green, and yellow costume. Oh no! Yes, and I was like, "Oh, sweetie, no, no, this is not for you. No, um, it's it's really unfortunate when you see it because there's times when people think they're going to do bad representation, and it slips up on them. My favorite example of that is Tyrock from the Legion of Superheroes. That his creators hated him. They made him because they were forced to. And they hate, they was like, we're going to give him a dumb name. We're going to give him dumb powers. We're going to do all this stuff. And then I saw growing up in Memphis, wait a minute, hold up. There's an island of black people in another dimension that don't have to deal with any of this foolishness that I have to deal with. And they're safe in the 30th freaking century. And they have a hero who can fly, who can kick it and fight, stand side by side with Superboy. This is pre-crisis planet juggling Superboy. And Superboy is like, oh, let me get out the way. Are you Tyrock? What you got going on, man? What you need? I'm like, okay, that, that's amazing. And yes, his costume is idiotic. And yes, he looks ridiculous. But, <laughs> you know, for, at that cost, sure, I'll take it. I'll absolutely take it. So do you think that uh, your experience as a person of color has uh, informed your work in a unique way? I don't think there's any way it could have not. Uh, I once wrote, there was a poem, what was that line from the poem that I did? Um, that, oh, I can't remember the specific line. God, I can't even remember my own poetry. Uh, but basically the idea was that I am a prism and that the light of the world shines through me in a way that it can only shine through my prism. That, you know, your prism is going to be different. Uh, you know, I don't know. I can't think of anybody else. So Brandon Thomas's perspective will be different. Stephanie Williams' perspective will be different. But my specific prism of being uh, the nerd that I was, of being the skinny picked on black kid who somehow turned into halfway being a bully, uh, that turned into, uh, uh, that went to USC, that worked in the corporate world, that did all these things. My specific prism of experience has to inform my story. Because as much research as I do into other people, as much research as I do to accomplish things, I'm working on a book called War Medicine, for example, which is a supernatural Western set in 1866, which requires a scary amount of research. Um, But even in that, looking at the experience of this uh, half black, half Native American woman in 1866, that has to be informed by my growing up in the South, because many of the things from 1866 were still very (laughs) <laughs> relevant, uh, even in the 1980s when I was growing up in, in, in the South. So, uh, and st- they absolutely believed in uh, erecting the statues for it. I'll put it that way. So, yes, all those things have to inform the work. They have to inform what's happening. In as much as you know, if I grew up in Bosnia, I would have a specific perspective that would be informed by that. My language that I use, English. I'm using a specific framework, a specific cultural and ideological framework built into the language. I, you know, people use words like, oh, this is a dark comedy. Oh, it's a dark comedy. So dark is this way? Is that what you're saying? You know, these are specific linguistic ideas built into the language phrased that way. 
Uh, that's why, like I said earlier, I corrected myself on my own ableism because using certain words can be harmful to people in ways we don't even understand. They can create a stigma. They can create negative ideas. And my experience has taught me that. Many people's experience has not. Many people's experience, even my own earlier experience in my 20s when I would work, walk around with T-shirts that had curse words on them, not recognizing that kids were around. You know, there is a sloppiness to many people that some of them grow out of and some of them don't. And I would like to think that I'm hoping to continue learning as best as I can. What emotional place do you write from? As much as my perspective is already going to be ladled over the story heavily, um, I try to approach each project from where it is. So, for example, War Medicine is a supernatural uh, Western that's a revenge story. Um, So that's a very specific way of doing things. Does it have my specific means of revenge in it? Absolutely. But uh, it is filtered through the lens of the characters and how they experience them. On the other hand, Project Wildfire is completely unlike me in any possible way. Mm-hmm. Project Wildfire, uh, we, we like to talk about the main character. We call him the man without lies. That there is no guile to him. There is no dissembling. There's no deception at any point in his life. He doesn't have a secret identity. He doesn't, <laughs> you know, he, he goes to hang out with the same people he hung out with growing up. He goes to the same chicken place on the corner that he always went to and, and, He lives a very authentic, personal, good life without deception, without anger in a lot of ways, Uh, in a way that a lot of people that I grew up with did, but I just didn't. So um, I would like to say each, I try to uh, uh, apply each, to each project, I try to apply its own emotional reality. Uh, So yeah, Project Wildfire is going to have a lot more jokes. There's no jokes in war medicine. Uh, you know, there's, each, each project has to be its own thing. Otherwise, I'm just going to be Aaron Sorkin and people are going to be like, oh, people are talking fast and walking. So, I, I, don't, <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I love Aaron Sorkin. I love, love, love Aaron Sorkin. But, you know, I'm not that kind of a stylist. No, I'm with you there. What's the coolest thing you've ever worked on? The coolest thing I've ever worked on? Yeah, pick well, your well, babies. The, the easy answer is always the next one. Uh, but <laughs> um, You've given that to me twice tonight. <laughs> well, it's like I said, it's the easiest answer to go with. Uh, <laughs> uh, what would be the... Okay, well, I would say the, the, novels, the novels that I've written are... They are my, my baby myself. So I've written many things that, you know... Oh, if somebody said, oh, we'll come along and we want to pay you this much to adapt it. Oh, okay, sure, whatever. There's no amount of money. There's no price that would get me to compromise an inch on the uh, the universe that I'm creating in my novels. Um, It is the most important story that I'm telling to me in that regard um, because it's all me. There's nobody else in it. It's not a collaboration in any way. It doesn't have to... Uh, it doesn't have to serve anyone's interests other than my own. And in the same way as when I'm DJing, when I mix something that's, you know, oh, well, okay, I'm doing a 70s show. All right, I guess I'm going to play Atomic Dog, which I'll mix into uh, Steve Arrington and Slave, uh, uh, Just a Touch of Love. And then, yeah, yeah you know, but, because I know, what, I know that's what the audience wants. This is not that. Uh, uh, and it's called the context. Uh, the whole continuity is called the context. And it's, it's for me. And... Uh, I've written three books now, the two books that are out and uh, the manuscript of the third one, which I'm going to make a slight edit to uh, in order to interest, hopefully, an agent. But um, yeah, it's it's a story that that doesn't compromise. And I've compromised on a lot of things, partially to make people, you know, uh, uh, partially to, just to play well with people. You know, you don't want to walk in and knock everybody down just because you think you're right or whatever. But um, it's a story that's just 100 percent. It just flows out of my head and it lives exactly as it does, even though I've got a perfect timeline document of 125,000 years of history in this specific continuity. So, nice. you know, it's uh, that's that's my thing. Yeah. Does the existence of digital distribution change the way that you create your stories? It does, actually. Um, I have always and this is from even when I started being a DJ, I've always hated lugging around things. 
having a trunk full of stuff. Yeah, the too. physical trappings of it exhaust me. Um, so, you know, when I was able to trade in the crates and crates of records for a two terabyte hard drive that fits in my pocket, um, I was elated in the same way with digital that, you know, I'm happy to sign your book. I would love to sign your book. And if, if that's what you want, but I don't want to carry books for you to sign. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to have a trunk full of them. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, uh, has a living room full of books that he has yet to, to sell that he, that he did from his own stuff. I don't want that. I don't want inventory. So digital, I believe, especially watching my kids, especially watching their friends, uh, I don't believe that print is going to be the dominant factor always. I don't. Um, and I know that's a financial hardship for a lot of people. And I know that the industry will have to adapt to make changes to make that work for people. But I believe the digital offers a greater freedom. I am much happier reading things on my iPad where I can just stop and zoom in like, wait a minute, what does that say? Oh my God, that actually is lettering. Oh my God, that says that thing. You know, <laughs> instead of trying to put my actual face next to it much closer and squint, which is hard uh, because I'm getting older. <laughs> so uh, I, I appreciate digital as an avenue. I don't believe it is matured yet because the industry is still in a great deal of growing pains. We have to, in many ways, a lot of the publishers have to protect the relationship with the direct market because the digital means of income is not strong enough to support them yet. Um, I'm not saying that as though they should abandon them. Uh, I'm saying that as though I've heard many people say they would if they could. And I don't know if that's you know adversarial or what, but for me, it gives me another means to do things. So, for example, my mom lives in Milwaukee. My sisters live in D.C. You know, oh, where can I get your book? Oh, it's on the Internet. You can just go now. Or better yet, you know what? Why don't you go to your library and look up Hoopla Digital? Because most of my books from Wonderman Comics, for example, are on Hoopla Digital. You can read them for free and I'll still get paid. Isn't that wonderful? Nice. So for me, digital offers these opportunities to expand people to my world expand my work to a different audience and different people so people can get a taste of it maybe if they don't have the financial wherewithal maybe if they don't have access i know there's lots of places in this country where it's difficult to drive to a comic book store and if you don't live near one you just might be screwed um so yeah digital democratizes that hopefully a great deal do you think the reluctance towards digital is related to the ongoing struggle with demographics change there is a part of that, yes. Um, comics is very intent on serving the customers they have, not the customers they want, because they don't really know who the customers that they want are. They don't know where they are. They don't know how to reach them because they've been in this Diamond Comics-related echo chamber for so long. That is partially demographic. It is partially business-wise. It's partially infrastructural, that the deadlines are so tight and there's so much work to do that the envisioning a better future is a luxury people don't have time to do. Um, in project management, we talk about this all the time. It's like, you don't know what you don't know, and you can't find out unless you stop to think about it. So uh, many people in comics are scrambling. I remember when Bob Shrek was the uh, editor at DC, he went from having two assistants to having one assistant to sharing an assistant. But the work didn't change. The work actually got more intense. There was a greater volume of it. So was he going to stop and have time to think about the elements of the industry that were problematic? No. He had to get the freaking books out on time. You know, there's a job to do. And, and it does not stop. That calendar will not forgive you. So there are demographic issues at play here. Um, places like Webtoon and Tapas and, and other sites like that uh, and formerly Tumblr, back when they were less weird, um, have have a reach into that, which is why you see the new Marie Javins led DC saying, "Yeah, Webtoon, let's make some friends, let's do some new stuff, let's try something different." Nice. Um, and I mean, she's a genius. She's a true, true genius. Love her. Um, 
And when you see that, you see the starts of change. Hopefully, it's a diversification and not an abandonment of one for the other. But, you know, I'm not that kind of psychic. I can't tell you what's going to happen yet. So do you have a, um, a favorite single issue story or title of all time? There's two answers to this. The, the, the first answer in terms of this is the best comic single issue that I've ever read would be Christopher Priest, Black Panther, number one. Absolutely. It nails everything that you want to do. It hooks you into every idea. It fulfills its promise. It balances spectacle with story. It's got dazzling artwork. It's got brilliant dialogue. Each character has their own voice. Uh, everything is right about it. Um, so that's the easy answer. However, the answer that's my brain's answer. The answer my heart would say, there's an issue of the Legion of Superheroes from the 80s, from the Great Darkness Saga, where Darkseid took the population of the planet Daxum. Well, no, he took the whole planet and moved it from a red sun system to a yellow sun system and ordered the entire population to fly off of the planet, turn their new heat vision eyes on their world, and carve it into his head. And I remember I was reading this as a kid, and I was like, holy crap. This is some whole other stuff here. And it stuck with me. It still sticks with me. And that's powerful. It, yeah, it really it it made me think. I'm like, okay, first of all, not just you 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 you're not just trying to save the world here. Saving the world is passe when you're moving planets from solar system to solar system. You're on a whole other level of storytelling here. And he was making it. This is uh, Giffen and Levitz. They were making it urgent, and they were making it real, and they were making it. There's a ticking clock and we got to get this going. Or, oh, my God, everything will change. And it was like, oh, they're not kidding. They're not kidding at all. Because if you've got a planet full of Superman class jerks running around, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the answer my heart would give. Nice. When was the last time a comic made you cry? A comic made me cry. My my wife would definitely have more notes on this because I'm getting old and emotional now. Um, <laughs> the last time a comic made me cry. The last time would be hard to remember because I read about 60 books a week and they all start to blur together after a while. I believe you. But I can definitely remember, like I said, that issue of Icon. Uh, Icon number two, uh, the second issue, uh, I believe, when he's receiving the key to the city. And I remember... I remember the lump in my throat. I remember reading it and stopping and feeling it. Wow. Like, okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's something. So I definitely, I mean, even now I'm choking up a little bit. But um, that's, that's the, it, it's not the most recent one, but it's definitely the one that stuck with me. The most, what would be the most recent one? Jeez. What? Oh, I know. Wait, no. Cry? No. Okay, no. Because I was shocked at the end of Vision, but no. Huh. I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that question because I don't remember. It's totally cool. Is there anybody that strikes you uh, when you think about it as uh, the most inspiring creator uh, in comics? Stephanie Williams. Mm-hmm. That was easy. There's a uh, yeah, uh, especially because her books comes out, like Nubian uh, and the Amazons comes out very soon. So uh, she, in a similar tr- tr- career trajectory as Gail Simone, she started out as uh, a satirist, as a humorist. She started, you know, uh, discussing her takes on the way characters would do this and characters would do that, and. Unlike Gail, she created her own thing. She created this living heroes book where. Um, she hired an artist and they do these single page kind of, you know, gags like Sunday comic sort of gags with Marvel characters. And there's so many wonderful little details in there. Sam Wilson wears a sweatshirt that says I'm the captain now. And, and the O is a Captain America shield. I mean, there's so many amazing things that happen in it. And she talks about, she was like, so she got this uh, uh, letter from Marvel. She was like, Oh, I'm about to get sued. And it was not, it was a job offer. Uh, because the quality of her writing, the clarity of her understanding of the characters was so strong. She inspires me in that, you know, 
she worked hard at it and she prepared for it. She's supported by her family. She's still, you know, she's a mom and she's a wife and she still takes care of all the things she has to do. But she's created this following and she's created this, this great body of work that's literally just getting started. And it's a really amazing to see. So yeah, that's super easy. Stephanie Williams, no question. Nice. Nice. Well, Hannibal, we are uh, coming up against the end of the show. Okay. Are you ready for the fun part? I love fun. Awesome. So is there a uh, particular Ninja Turtle that you see yourself as? I am definitely Michelangelo. Uh, I, <laughs> I, if, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, because I'm going to feel real bad, I kind of want to look <laughs> it up. But um, Michelangelo was the more carefree one. He was. And, and that's where I would like to install myself. I, I, I'm probably going to be more Raphael in a day-to-day standpoint, but I would definitely want to be Michelangelo. See, I see myself as Michelangelo too, so it all works out. It's it's the mm-hmm. best. He's the best turtle. He just is. Yeah, he, he's living his joy. He really is. All that pizza, you know, you say cowabunga mm-hmm. now and then, you're good to go. It's a simple life. <laughs> so um, if you, had a, if you were going to build a Batman-style utility belt that's relevant to your life what would be in it okay this is super funny because i literally already did that (laughs) (laughs) my wife always clowns me i went and bought what's called a tactical pouch um which is like it's basically a camera bag but you know they call it a tactical pouch because they wanted to sell it on soldier fortune or whatever and um, it's got sanitizer. I'm like, I'm literally opening it up right now. I, I thought a, I, I thought a tactical pouch was like a fanny pack, but with a cool name. It's not as wide as a fanny pack. Gotcha. A, a fanny pack. Uh, this is this is smaller. So, like, say for instance, if you took um, your average SLR camera and took the lens off, you could fit it in here. Gotcha. It's about that. Big. Um, but you know, it hits. I've got my work phone, my personal phone, hand sanitizer. Uh, I'm going to crack this open here. For, it's, it's, it's so funny because literally I did all this stuff uh, a long time ago. It's got a flash drive full of stuff that I don't want to forget. It's got two, uh, these are eighth inch to quarter inch uh, headphone adapters. It's got a lightning, uh, it's got a headphone adapter to lightning dongle for uh, iPhones in case somebody doesn't have one. Um, I've got tissues i've got money i've got oh project wildfire stickers i forgot these were in here and <laughs> uh i've got a multi-tool which is one of those things it's got like you know here, let me crack this bad boy open and get to see what we got here it's got pliers it's got knife it's got a can opener it's got a file it's got all kinds of shenanigans there so that's there as well um and of course i always carry headphones with me uh, wherever I am or whatever I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I, I had to do a radio show once and they were like, Oh no, we don't have enough headphones. I'm like, I'm good. He's like, <laughs> Oh, but we need, we need an adapter. I'm like, I got one. And they're like, Oh my God. <laughs> that is I'm awesome. Like, I'm like, you should see my car. I've got 50 feet of rope in the car. I've got all, they're like, what are you doing with 50 feet of rope? I'm like, don't ask. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, I, it's <laughs> funny that you asked this question because I've totally already done this. And uh, I'm trying to think the only other thing that, I don't have right now because I'm in the house all the time is breath mints because I would always like to be re- like, I hate the way the Tic Tacs rattle in your pocket though, but they were the easiest ones to carry and they were the easiest ones to fit in the utility, the little tactical pouch thing. For sure. But yeah, I would always uh, have hand sanitizer, breath mints, headphones, headphone gear, uh, and, and stuff to, you know, move data around because you never know. Oh yeah. All of those things are hugely important. Yeah, the flash drive. The flash uh, drive fits into a phone. It's got like a lightning on one end and like USB on the other, so I can say, "Oh, you want that on your computer? Sure, hang on a second. And you know, yeah. Nice. So, what inspires you? Hmm. I have this pressure inside of my head. These stories, these concepts. I'll be listening to a song, for example. Um, or, or I'll be, uh, just watching something go by as I'm driving and I'll catch a glimpse of something and see, huh, that's a thing. I was driving down Pico Boulevard in Los Angeles and there was a guy standing, uh, in the middle of the street, typing furiously with one hand on an Apple laptop. And he wasn't anywhere near anybody. And he was just like typing furiously. And I was like, what's going on there? 
that's a story I want to be involved with. But I didn't have time to because I had to go to work. So, <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff about music. Like if you, there's so many song lyrics and song titles in in so much of my work. Um, I, I like there's certain songs that I hear them. And I'm like, this is this story. I need to make it this story. Or like if I hear, um, what's the one song? We found love by Rihanna and Calvin Harris. I know that's the last scene of a big set piece story in the superhero thing that I've been sitting on for, I don't know, four years. Um, so I kind of take in the world in that prismatic way, as I said, and some of it beams out as lights immediately and it goes, goes, goes. And some of it just bounces around and some of those bounce things bouncing around kind of connect with each other and they'll shoot out. And sometimes they just sit there. There's, there's a character I've wanted to use. Gosh for at least 25 years, this magician character that I came up with. And I just haven't found the right place for her. I just, like, every time I start to, I'm like, no, that's not right for you. No, I'm going to keep you over here. You're not ready yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, the world itself inspires me. And there's so much wonder and there's so much possibility. And there's so many interesting things to do in interesting places to see. I'm literally writing right now a story set in Accra in Ghana. Um, where I got to travel because my wife is smart enough to talk me into traveling. And nice. if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have the material for the story that is going to be hopefully a great opportunity for me. And, and yeah, so there's the, the world itself kind of just pours itself into my eyes and ears and it bounces around and I shake it around like, you know, a bad, you know, James Bond cocktail before it eventually one way or another comes out. So what criteria do you have when you look for a sidekick or minion? <laughs> oh, wow. This is, why are you literally in my life so much? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm a supervisor at my job. And one of the questions I've asked each one of my direct reports, and I have three now, is do you mind if I call you minion? Because I view myself as my boss's minion. She is a minion of her boss and so on far up the line. Uh, we're only like three, three or four from the CEO, but whatever. And um, none of them have had a beef with it yet. And all of us get along famously. It's amazing. Um, when I look for somebody who is going to serve uh, and to follow, it's important that they be able to faithfully uh, understand what I'm saying. So, like, if I say something, I'm like, could you repeat that back to me? And they repeat it back faithfully. And then that they are able to execute that faithfully. So that requires a great deal of competence. Excuse me, I've just been drinking water. So uh, making sure that they have the skill set to accomplish the things that they're doing. A lot of people talk a good game, but they don't necessarily know what they're doing. Sometimes I talk a good game and don't know what I'm doing, but I'm normally able to figure it out. So, uh, you know, if, as, as I said, if someone asks you, are you a god, say yes. Uh, <laughs> every <but> time. <laughs> every time. No, <laughs> Don't take any days off from that one. Uh, so... Yeah, I look for people who are interested in creating good things. There's a there's a training called social styles that they that they brought up to my job where there are four basic types of workers, they said. There are amiables, expressives, uh, analyticals, and drivers. Amiables want to be liked, expressives want to be heard, analyticals want to be right, and drivers want to get it done. I'm a driver. I'm only interested in the work, and I don't care how many eggs I have to break to make that omelet. So for my minions, they have to understand that the work is what I'm interested in. I can show the interest in their lives. I know the names of all my direct reports, kids or whatever. But it's at the end of the day, the thing I'm focused on is going to be the work. And I know that as a minion, taking care of the minions is going to make the work better. That if I say, oh, no, no, take that time off. You need to go to the dentist? Go take, go to the dentist. I don't need to. I don't need you, your mouth rotting up my face. I don't need that. Uh, so uh, it's important to understand people that can do that as well. Because when my wife needs something, my kids need something, I'm going to bounce out of this job. I am. So you better be ready to figure it out on your own. And we better have a clear line of communication so that can be crystal clear and everybody can understand. Um, yeah, that's uh, like I said, it's so funny you said minion because I was like, oh my God, I literally said that to those clowns, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> nice. So where do you find joy? Uh, joy comes from within. 
It has to. Anything else is intoxication. Gotcha. Um, I, uh, you know, not to not to get all super cliche in Whitney Houston, but, you know, uh, uh, it was a lonely place to be. So I had to learn to depend on me. Um, there are many means by which you can derive pleasure. As, as Dennis Leary said, you have a cookie, you, you, you smoke a cigarette, you have an orgasm or whatever. Um, but those things are fleeting. Joy, sustainable joy has to come from within. It has to come from a satisfaction with who you are and what you are doing, uh, how you move through the world. And I understand, for example, like my son, he had a, 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 some challenges with that before he came out and before he had an understanding of it. He's like, this is really who I am. And I'm like, all right, this is who you are. I believe in the uh, principle of Kuji Chagalia, which is self-determination. If you say this is who you are, I'm going to believe you. I don't have any reason not to. Go with that. And I will follow through everything that that means. So, uh, yeah, joy has to come from within or else uh, it's too dependent on, on the world and the world can't be trusted. You can't trust it with your heart that way. That's insightful. All right. Um, congratulations. You've Thank just you. defeated Thanos. You now have full access and control over the Infinity Gauntlet, <laughs> which gives you the power to bend reality to your whim. I'm sure you have a huge list of things you want to do with it. Big oh, list. What's the first thing that comes to mind? Okay, before, well, before the first thing, I have to know, have I already taken out the stupid superheroes or who are going to take, try to come after me, or do I still have to deal with them? Um, wait, which answer is more fun? If I haven't dealt with them, the answer is quicker. Uh, <laughs> I'll put it that way. Gotcha. Um, let's say you've dealt with them already. Oh, if I'm okay. If I've dealt with them already, <clears throat> then the first thing I have to do is I have to communicate the concept that humanity is a sexually transmitted disease that, uh, by and large, the damage that we have done and can do is enormous and must be controlled at all costs. So, um, Oh, I don't. Oh, I was about to say a whole bunch of stuff in the context, a whole bunch of stuff I haven't even put out. I, I've worked a lot of these concepts into my my writing already. But uh, basically, the idea that uh, uh, people's attachment to plots of land, to um, certain ideas that they have in that, that that their culture has taught them about other people, about the way they should react to other people, are deleterious to society in general. Those things have to go immediately. Um, that the idea of universal basic income for people has to be immediate, that everybody deserves food. Everybody deserves a right to have somewhere to live. Everybody deserves a right to clean water and, and peace of mind. And if they do so, they will have time to create wonder and amazing things. Um, I believe that, you know, personally, I think rich people are, are a plague on society. So <laughs> there's got to be some limits to that. Sure, you can do some extra stuff, and that's great and all. But, you know, I need you not to be like Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Lex Luthor rich. That's too far. You know, if, you're, if, you're, if you find yourself dressed in fetish gear, beating up poor people in alleys, you've probably gone wrong somewhere. So that's just <laughs> my opinion. Um, so that would be that. However, if... I haven't dealt with the heroes and I don't know if I'm going to be able to deal with them. The answer is so much quicker and so much easier. I will end everything for everyone, every whim and everywhere. Like that. It's all over. Wow. Because that way, that way I don't have to worry about things screwing up again. And you can build fresh. No, no, no. I'll be gone too. There's a lot. Uh, <laughs> what's the line from uh, that song? Everything is going to burn. We'll all take turns. I'll get mine too. Nice. So what's next for the incomparable Hannibal Taboo? Well, the immediate next thing will be that I will be having False Flag Fridays throughout the fall uh, on Operative.net for free with illustrations from DeMar Douglas. It's a great uh, take on the idea of if you mix G.I. Joe with uh, professional wrestling and nice. people really got hurt. <laughs> and that's just part of the show. That's free. And uh, 
there's some interesting stuff going on with that. People have seen that I've cast Danny Fernandez as Snakebird. I've cast Damien Poitier as uh, Black Fury. I've cast Damon Allums as uh, the shop steward. And there's all kinds of interesting things happening with that that will play out in greater detail in, in the next year. As I said, Project Wildfire will be in comic book stores November 24th. And I'm very excited about that. Project Wildfire number two will be in comic book stores. It's bi-monthly. So that'll be in January, I guess, for my birthday. And uh, I hope by then the artist will be done with the first miniseries of War Medicine, which I just got the green light from the publisher to write six more miniseries, which is a pleasant surprise. <laughs> but it's so much research. Oh my God, it's so much research. <laughs> 1866 was a long time ago and they did not have Google. So... <laughs> So there's that. Um, that's three things going on there. I'm not able to talk about that one. Oh, uh, I forgot the regular stuff. Uh, of course, I'm the head comics reviewer at Bleeding Cool. So that stuff's out weekly. I'm on the I Heart Radio podcast, Nerdorama with Mo and Tawala, every week as well, which I've actually got to record later tonight. And on that one, I don't think I'm forgetting anything now. No, I think that's it. But I'm sure somebody's going to be like, oh my God, I can't believe you forgot this. So. I hope I didn't screw anything up. Awesome. Well, Hannibal, I wanted to thank you for uh, just taking the time uh, to, uh, to spend me th- with me this weekend. Uh, you have just been an absolutely fantastic guest. Thank you. This has been a really, really deep. In- like, I had to be, I was like, oh, wow, this isn't a normal question. Oh, okay, <laughs> let's do something new. Cool. I love that. Awesome. So uh, where can people find you online? Uh, they can find me at HannibalTaboo.com. Uh, that's H-A-N-N-I, B as in bounce, A-L, T as in tough, A, B as in bounce, U. They can also use at sign Hannibal Taboo on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, my, uh, Tumblr, MySpace, Radiation from the Sun, uh, Receipt in Your Mom's Purse, and everywhere that you want to be. No kidding, you're still on MySpace? Uh, fun story, all of us secretly are. They put all the pages back up. They just didn't put up the blogs. Oh, All that no stuff's kidding. Still there. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't realize that. That's embarrassing. That is. Oh, my God. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's time to go. Wasn't that fun? The Panel Garden is a show about the things we love. And if you're feeling super generous, feel free to go to buymeacoffee.com slash Eva is adorable. There, you can support what we do by chipping in as little as a dollar. Not financially able? That's okay. Shares on social media and reviews on your favorite podcast listening platforms help us a ton. In any case, thanks for being awesome. The show is produced and hosted by the adorable Eva Webb. Opening theme by Antonia Marquis and Tyler Scott. Closing theme by Mikey Flash of Speed Force Music. The credits are read by the awesome and talented Kat Britano. That's me. The Panel Garden is a production of Unicorn Fight Industries. Join us next time for another exciting adventure in cyberspace. See you then. Bye.